Welcome to our continuing 2017 educational webinar series. I am Dr. Jill Brooks, Senior Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, a hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Shauna Itry of Berger Montague presenting False Claims Act Liability and Whistleblower Laws. Ms. Itry concentrates her practice on complex litigation and has substantial experience representing whistleblowers in cases involving fraud against the U.S. government. Ms. Itry has successfully represented whistleblowers in key TAM or False Claims Act lawsuits in state and federal courts throughout the United States. She has worked on a series of False Claims Act cases against large drug companies for fraudulent Medicare and Medicaid drug pricing. This litigation has returned well over a billion dollars to state and federal governments pursuant to the Federal and State False Claims Acts. Ms. Hedgery received her BA and MA from Stanford University and earned her Juris Doctor from the Villanova University School of Law, where she was Editor-in-Chief of the Villanova Law School Sports and Entertainment Law Journal. She is presently an adjunct professor at Villanova University, teaching a white-collar crime and corporate deviance course. She was placed on Philadelphia's First Judicial District's 2010 Roll of Honor for pro bono service for her service in the community, including acting as a volunteer attorney for the Education Law Center, Veterans Pro Bono Consortium, Philadelphia VIP Mortgage Foreclosure Program, and Homeless Advocacy Project, NHAIS. Ms. Itchery is currently licensed to practice in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and admitted to practice before the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. Okay, Shauna, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brooks. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, a little bit of an overview of what we will be talking about. Um, we'll primarily be focusing on the False Claims Act, both the Federal False Claims Act and the State False Claims Act. Um, at the end of the presentation, um, there is one or two slides dedicated to the IRS Whistleblower Act and the SEC Whistleblower Act. Um, but primarily, it'll be the Federal False Claims Act. Um, and all of the State False Claims Act, there's about 26 and counting State False Claims Act that is modeled after the Federal False Claims Act. So when I'm talking throughout the slide, while I'll be referring to the Federal False Claims Act, some of the State False Claims Acts do also apply. What is the False Claims Act? Uh, the False Claims Act is a very unique statute um, in that it allows private citizens, individuals, to file a complaint on behalf of the government. They can stand in the shoes of the government. Um, now, this is a unique statute because um, typically, in order to bring a lawsuit, you need to have standing. And to have standing, you need to be harmed. In this instance, it is the government that is technically harmed. And the whistleblower, relator, the person that brings the False Claims Act suit, um, has knowledge has some sort of information that the government has been defrauded. Now, why would a whistleblower bring forth a False Claims Act lawsuit? It would be because under the False Claims Act, um, if the government recovers money as a result of the False Claims Act lawsuit, the whistleblower will get a portion of what is recovered. And these cases um, tend to be very large in the multi-millions of dollars. Um, so the whistleblower is incentivized to bring uh, lawsuits under the False Claims Act. The general success of the False Claims Act, a little bit of history here. The False Claims Act was actually enacted in 1863. Um, Abraham Lincoln signed it into a law, um, therefore it's sometimes referred to as Lincoln's Law. Um, and it was enacted in the Civil War. What was happening was um, the Union Army would be contracting with, or the government would be contracting with third parties um, to supply um, defense items. And what happened was, was these third parties that were contracting with the government were defrauding the government. They were providing the government with um, uniforms that were, uh, would when it rained, they would just completely melt, break down. That's why they got the word shoddy. Um, they were supplying the government with decrepit horses. So what the government did was they enacted the False Claims Act um, to, in order to break down all this fraudulent conduct by third parties. Now, the law was very different in 1863, and, and it, 
really fell into a defunct state until uh, the False Claims Act amendments in 1986. Um, at that time, um, it was not a very um, used statute um, until these amendments made it more usable to plaintiffs and plaintiffs attorneys. And it, in, if you can see here in this um, graph on the PowerPoint, um, the, since 1986, the amount of whistleblower uh, claims under the False Claims Act has risen substantially. Um, this shows information from 86 to about 2010, and you can see it's over about $15 billion has been recovered since then. Um, since in the last 29 years, about $40 billion have been recovered under the False Claims Act, um, and it has become one of the more, most important tools in fighting government waste, fraud, and abuse. Now this next uh, slide shows what type of cases are involved in the False Claims Act lawsuits. Um, and that's why we're here today because you can see um, health care ends up being a majority of, of the cases that are filed. Second in line is the defense contracting cases. Um, there's also other smaller cases involving you know, the Small Business Administration or for-profit schools. Essentially, any time government money is involved, there can be a False Claims Act lawsuit. And the reason why there are so many False Claims Act lawsuits in healthcare is because so much government money is dedicated to healthcare in the United States. I'm talking about Medicare, I'm talking about Medicaid, in the billions of dollars annually. Um, some other types of health care is TRICARE. Uh, Veterans Administration money is, is all dedicated towards health care. So the more money that is dedicated to a specific industry, um, the more um, fraud tends to occur in that industry. Um, briefly, not only is, is the False Claims Act unique in the fact that it allows an individual to sue on behalf of the government, it is also very, very interesting and unique procedurally. Um, practically speaking, these are the steps that occur when you want to file a False Claims Act lawsuit. Um, step number one, what typically happens, is a whistleblower uh, within a company, um, or, or you know, it could be a competitor company, has some sort of evidence or knowledge that a company, their company, a competitor company, might be committing fraud. Um, or waste or abuse. And so what that whistleblower typically does is the whistleblower might you know, notify the company. Um, the company might fix the problem and then there's no False Claims Act case. The company also might choose to ignore the problem. They also might choose to retaliate against the whistleblower and unfortunately in my line of business I see a lot of those cases. Um, what would happen in that instance is the whistleblower um, might come to a whistleblower attorney, like myself, um, and they will talk to me and consult with me about the potential case. They will show me what evidence they have, and I will talk to them about um, you know, what, how, what I think the likelihood of success are, of their case are. I will go with them and talk to them about the pros and cons of filing a case. If um, we decide that we think there's a potential case here, um, and we work on a contingency fee basis, so we only get paid if the whistleblower gets paid and all of our costs are out of our pocket. So uh, we really need to be invested in the case and we really need to think that it's a good case. Um, if we think it's a good case and if the whistleblower says, you know what, I want to um, go forward with it, then we work up a case, we gather all of the evidence and we draft and file a complaint, um, similar to any other type of legal complaint that you might come across. Um, but this complaint is filed under seal. Um, it's typically hand filed, um, but it's filed under seal so the defendant does not know that the case has been filed against it. Um, the case is filed under seal in the court um, where the conduct has occurred. Um, the case is time stamped. Um, and then the whistleblower attorney serves that complaint on the government. Now, um, at this time, when the government has the case, um, the only people that know about it is the court, the government, the whistleblower, and the whistleblower attorney. Um, at this time, the government begins its investigation of the case. This is step two. Um, and the investigation is, is 
primarily starts with an interview of the whistleblower um, represented by the whistleblower attorney. The, what will happen is we'll go to the um, prosecutor's office, we'll talk about the allegations in the complaint, um, we'll, the government will assess the whistleblower's credibility and assess the facts in the case and conduct its own investigation. At this time, everything is still under seal, and that seal is there to protect the government's investigation. Um, the defendant does not know at this point that it has been sued. Um, initially, the seal is for 60 days, but typically, um, and in my experience always, the case is the seal is extended by motion of the government to the court, and that and it's usually granted. Um, cases typically remain under seal for um, one to two years for the more large or complex cases. Um, it could be up to 10 years that the case is under seal. So these, these cases are a, a very big investment in money and time and resources. Um, so when the government's investigating its case, um, it, it comes to, has to come to a conclusion. It decides it, if it's going to intervene in the case or it decides if it's going to decline to intervene in the case. If the government intervenes in the case, that means it will take the case on, it'll prosecute the case, the case will come out from under seal, and it'll be litigated like a normal case. Discovery will begin. Um, depositions, uh, requests for production of documents, so on and so forth. Now, if the government decides to decline the case, um, that means the case then goes to a whistleblower, and the whistleblower um, can choose to continue the case and litigate the case, or the whistleblower can choose to voluntarily dismiss the case and not go forward with the case. Um, either way, after this intervention decision, the case comes out from under seal, and defendants are notified that a False Claims Act case has been defiled against it. Um, now, back to the declination decision. If the government decides to decline, it declines for a variety of reasons. Um, the worst reason is that they look at the facts and they don't think that the case is there. Or they looked at the legal theory and they don't think that there's any liability on behalf of the defendant. But the government could also decline for a variety of other reasons. Um, maybe they don't have the resources to pursue the case. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the whistleblower is going to not litigate the case if it's declined, but there's a high likelihood that they won't, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. But to go forward to case number, or step number three, rather, um, after this intervention decision, the case comes out from under seal, um, it enters into discovery or it's dismissed um, or settled or goes to trial, just like another case. Um, step number four, if the case happens to be successful, if the case settles, if the case goes to trial and there's a verdict uh, on behalf of the government um, and money is recovered, um, then the whistleblower gets a share of that recovery. Which brings me to my next slide. As I talked about, um, just to set realistic expectations in this False Claims Act field, most cases are not joined by the government. In fact, 80% of cases are typically declined by the government. Um, and declined cases are generally dropped. So of those 80% of cases um, that are declined by the government, 80% of that 80% are dropped by the whistleblower for a variety of reasons. So these cases are very, very hard cases. Um, and they cost a lot of money and resources. Um, on average, about 100 to 115 false claims tax cases are positively resolved per year. Um, they take an average of 38 months for about three years, but they can take up to over a decade. And I have litigated cases that have taken over a decade since the time of filing through the government investigation, through discovery, and finally to settlement. They take a long time and require a lot of patience. Um, back to the relator share, why do it then? If it takes so much time and it costs so much money, um, the reason that whistleblowers and whistleblower attorneys will take on these cases is because if, if the government recovers money, they receive a share of that recovery. Now, under the statute, if government intervenes in the case, they take the case on and recover money, the whistleblower receives a share of the recovery from the amount of 15 to 25% of the recovery. 
if the government does not intervene and the whistleblower decides to go forward with the case and recovers money, then the percentage of the share increases to about 25 to 30 percent of the recovery. There are instances when the recovery um, has been reduced. In those instances, it's when the relator or the whistleblower had planned and initiated the fraud. Um, and in cases where the uh, whistleblower was convicted of a crime arising from the fraud, they can be dismissed from the case um, and recover nothing. This slide talks about what you must prove in order to file a False Claims Act lawsuit. Um, now, this is very, very legal, legalese, so I'm just going to briefly go over this. Uh, the first element of a False Claims Act lawsuit is that a false statement um, must be shown, or it must be shown that the defendant engaged in a fraudulent course of conduct. The defendant has to act, quote unquote, knowingly. Uh, when I say knowingly, I don't mean actual knowledge. Um, a, a company cannot um, commit fraud and say, well, I didn't know of the regulation. They can't stick their head in the sand. But the, but the company does have to have some uh, element of scienter or knowledge and knowingly break the law. Um, the statement or conduct must be material. Material is also a term of art. Um, it means that the conduct must have uh, mattered to the government. It must have caused the government to change its mind. If it had known, it would not have given funds to the company. And finally, it must have caused the government to pay out money or to forfeit money due. In order to solidify um, the understanding of False Claims Act, I thought it would be helpful to um, talk to you about uh, general examples of false of fraud that have been um, brought under the False Claims Act. Uh, the first example here is fraud that occurs in hospital settings. Um, in, I call it inpatient versus outpatient fraud. Um, when performing um, and billing for procedures, um, the doctor at the hospital um, can either perform and bill procedures as an outpatient meaning the person comes to the hospital and then they leave the hospital that same day or inpatient, meaning the patient is admitted into the hospital. When the patient is admitted or billed for or Medicare or Medicaid is billed for an inpatient service, it's typically a larger service, therefore a larger reimbursement. Um, and these, and there has been a slew of inpatient versus outpatient cases in hospitals where doctors are admitting patients inpatient when they don't need to be inpatient, they should be outpatient, um, and they do this only to obtain um, additional money. This is a type of uh, healthcare fraud that can be pursued under the False Claims Act. And in fact, a while ago, the DOJ announced a settlement with SSM of Healthcare of Oklahoma Incorporated in the amount of approximately half a million dollars to settle allegations that the hospital violated the False Claims Act by billing Medicare for inpatient services that should have been billed as outpatient services. The government had alleged that individuals who were presented to the emergency room um, and patients who were scheduled for planned medical procedures were admitted to the hospital and the services were built on an inpatient basis when they should have been built on an outpatient basis. Um, another example of potential fraud is unlicensed billing. Now this is called billing for services of by um, improperly licensed personnel or for professionals that are excluded from participation in Medicare and Medicaid. So someone goes to a hospital, um, they receive a procedure from someone who is unlicensed to bill under med to perform the procedure and then the procedure is billed to Medicare, this is improper. Um, now, uh, this is, brings up a very important point. Um, one would not br bring a false claims act if this happened once or twice. That would be more of a personal liability lawsuit. Um, this would be a, become a false claims act if it was an executive policy, if it was happening regularly, if executives of the hospital were directing and forcing their doctors or medical professionals to conduct, um, to act in this way. 
So this isn't just a technical violation. This isn't just a rogue employee. Um, this is a hospital policy. Um, this is best of the time when false claims act lawsuits are brought. Um, the last example on this slide is upcoding, and this is it's pretty straightforward fraud. It's falsely representing that patients received a more complex or expensive service than was actually provided. By way of simple example, a patient goes into um, doctor, hospital, um, and needs a toenail removed. The toenail is removed, and the hospital bills for a toe amputation. That is a very, very simple and painful example of um, upcoding. Some more examples um, of fraud under the False Claims Act um, include charging for services or supplies that were not provided. Um, this is also very, very simple. Um, it can be a hospital or a doctor, an independent physician, submitting claims to Medicare or Medicaid for services or supplies that the provider didn't deliver to the patient or beneficiary. Um, they were just lying. They didn't actually do what they said they were going to do. Um, another example is falsifying or failing to maintain records. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid only reimburse a provider for services and supplies um, if those services and supplies are medically necessary. And uh, providers are required to maintain um, forms of documentation um, demonstrating that the procedure or the supplies was, in fact, medically necessary. Um, if they falsify those records or fail to maintain them, then the provider may be committing fraud when it submits claims for payment to Medicare or Medicaid. Um, these are reasonable and necessary cases. Um, these cases are very, very hard uh, because they involve so much investigation. <clears throat> Usually what happens in the investigation is the government contains a statistically valid random sample of files, and they uh, engage a medical expert to review those files, and the expert um, see, looks at the documentation and looks at the billing and compares them and see if, in fact, an uh, expert determines that the case or the procedure was uh, medically necessary. And then if they do, what percentage of that is um, the percentage is applied to the whole universe of claims that that hospital or facility has submitted to Medicare or Medicaid. Another uh, example of fraud of the False Claims Act, off-label marketing. Now, these cases were very, very popular about five to ten years ago. Uh, you probably had seen a lot of um, major, major, huge settlements involving off-label marketing. We'll go into a, a case study on the next slide. Um, but off-label marketing, just briefly described, is um, the use of a drug or a medical device for an unimproved indication. So what happens is a, a pharmaceutical company or a medical device company goes to the FDA and they get their drug or their device approved for a, a specific indication or reason. Um, now, a doctor is allowed to prescribe a drug or use a medical device um, that is not indicated, that is not, you know, written on the label. However, um, a pharmaceutical company or medical device company cannot market that drug or device off-label. They can't go to the doctor and say, hey, you can use this drug or device off-label. And um, it will include um, using the device or drug for an unapproved age group, an unapproved dosage, or an unapproved form. And here below are two um, very basic examples of um, two off-label marketing cases. Um, one was against Park Davis, or Pfizer promoted its drug um, that was indicated for seizures um, for all types of pain and psychiatric disorders. Um, these cases were rather large. They recovered billions of dollars to the government. Um, more recently, there have been less off-label marketing cases. Um, there have been more off-label marketing of devices. Um, here is an example of a case brought against Abbott Laboratories. Um, it had a scheme to support the FDA approval process processed, excuse me, for vascular ascent by fraudulently obtaining FDA clearance for the devices. 
moving on to um, a case study. Now that we've gone through a few examples of um, what kind of conduct can be prosecuted under the False Claims Act, I thought it might be helpful to look at a case in particular. Um, this case that we're talking about now was brought against GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK. Um, the case had a lot of allegations. One of them was um, that Glaxo, or GSK, uh, uh, con um, committed off-label marketing of its drugs, Welbutrin and Paxil. Now, the FDA had approved Welbutrin uh, for the treatment of a specific psychiatric disorder, a uh, major depressive disorder. Now, GSK, uh, executives at the company, instructed its sales team um, and its marketing team developed these instructions and distributed marketing material um, stating that Welbutrin could be used for weight loss, it could be used for ADHD, addiction, etc. And not only did it market these drug, this drug for off-label uses, but it also paid kickbacks, paid money, or gave supplies to physicians if they, um, so they prescribed the drug. Um, and including in the allegation is that GSK um, distributed and ghost wrote uh, a misleading medical journal that misreported um, that a clinical trial of Paxil uh, was effective in treating children with depression and therefore um, promoted Paxil for pediatric use when it was not approved for pediatric use. It was only approved for adult use. Now, some of the theories of liability included a fraud on the FDA theory, um, saying that GSK failed to include safety data regarding the, uh, the cardiovascular devices on the FDA uh, for Avandia, and um, a false of price reporting, so that they bundled products and offered discounts, but failed to report the best price to the government. So this is sort of a smorgasbord of fraud. This complaint included a lot of different allegations. Um, it included off-label marketing that we discussed. It also included a, a price reporting fraud. Um, there are certain uh, regulations that require the government to get the best price. So if a pharmaceutical company charges um, a hospital um, $10 for the drug, it cannot charge or bill Medicare or Medicaid $15. Um, if it charges $10 for the drug, it needs to report to the government that, hey, I charged $10 for this drug, therefore I owe you a rebate of $5. Um, and there have been a lot of cases with allegations of this type of fraud. Now, this case against GSK was very successful and ended up settling for about $3 billion. Um, $1 billion of those dollars were dedicated to a criminal settlement. At that time, it was the largest fine ever imposed for a U.S. corporation in a criminal case. Um, interestingly, the $2 billion went to settle the civil claim. Um, if you are a whistleblower and your, um, your case ends up settling criminally, unfortunately, um, arguably, you do not get a portion of that recovery. Um, now, to break it down, the off-label marketing slash kickback claims settled for about $1 billion um, for, and $210 million of that went to the Medicaid or the state programs. The rest went to the federal government. Uh, the Avandia claims settled for about $657 million. A portion went to states. A larger portion went to the federal government. Um, for the price reporting fraud, it allocated $300 million. Um, and at the end here, um, you'll see that there is a, a five-year um, integrity agreement corporate integrity agreement that was entered between Glaxo and HHS OIG that mandates um, a change in the compensation, compensation structure and implements transparency in research. So um, there are certain uh, structures that GSK must abide by, certain reports they must submit to the government for five years to ensure that they are um, acting appropriately. Um, one last type of case that I'm going to discuss before I'm going to um, give some important um, takeaways is stark and kickback cases. Now, while off-label marketing cases have become less popular, um, you have not seen in recent times um, a lot of settlements 
related to off-label marketing of drugs or pharmaceuticals, um, stark and kickback cases, there's been sort of a resurgence of these types of cases. Now, the cases I have um, listed as examples here are some older cases, um, but they also they give a great understanding of um, what, what Stark and um, the anti-kickback statute is about. Um, so this first case is brought against a Toomey hospital. Um, they engaged um, physicians in part-time employment arrangements that were above fair market value. Um, fair market value is something you will hear a lot in these cases. It's the um, salary that is the standard over um, which physicians should be receiving. It's a very, very complicated expert-driven case. Um, that basically the allegation is that um, Toomey Hospital paid these physicians a lot of money, not for their services, but to prefer, refer patients to their hospitals. Um, a very, very uh, in-depth financial expert analysis is required to prove this case. Um, this case ended up going to trial. It was not settled. And uh, there was a jury verdict of $45 million. Um, similar type of arrangement, employment arrangement above fair market value with Covenant Medical Center settled for $4.5 billion. Um, and this last example on the slide is McAllen Hospital settled for $27.5 million. Um, and what happened here is a little bit different type of of kickback. Um, the hospital was giving sham directorships. Um, so physician Smith um, worked uh, as a surgeon in the hospital. They say, hey, hey physician Smith, I'm gonna, you're going to be the director of this department. Um, to be the director, uh, physician Smith says, that's great. What do I have to do? They say absolutely nothing, but we're going to pay you 50 grand to be the director. Um, that is considered or was considered in this case a kickback. It's a sham directorship. This physician doesn't need to do anything in order to be the director. They just receive an extra m amount of money um, to refer patients to the hospital. Bogus lease arrangements um, include the hospital charging less than fair market value for office space. That is and was considered a, a form of a kickback to the doctor in exchange for referring patients to the hospital. Um, so those are some very, very um, brief examples of Stark and kickback cases. Again, there has been a recent resurgence of these types of cases, but they are very, very hard to prove uh, because of the fair market value requirement and the need for a strong expert analysis and strong expert mm -hmm. testimony. Things to look out for. So we talked a lot about the False Claims Act cases, and at the end of the presentation, um, you will be able to ask some questions. Um, and we went through some basic examples. We went through a case study. Um, and now I thought it would be appropriate or a good time to talk about some takeaway points, some things to look out for, some things to be wary of. Um, so under the False Claims Act, um, we talked about what a unique statute it is and unique in substantive, unique in the fact that you don't need um, standing per se to file a case. Um, you can file a case on behalf of the federal government. Unique in the fact that there is a seal in place. Um, it's also unique in the fact that there is a first to file provision, a first to file bar. Um, this first to file bar um, means that Say there's a whistleblower a case against company um, ABC Corporation. Whistleblower A has evidence of the fraud. Whistleblower A drafts the complaint, retains an attorney, and files the case. Subsequently, it could be a year later, it could be 10 years later, it could be two days later. Whistleblower B also works at Corporation ABC. Um, discovers the same fraud, uh, retains a different attorney, files a different complaint in a different jurisdiction, um, but it's the same conduct. If the case against ABC Corporation either settles or there's a jury verdict and money is recovered, whistleblower A 
will receive the proceeds, and whistleblower B will receive nothing. Um, that is called the first to file bar. Whistleblower B was the second filed complaint, so whistleblower B receives nothing. Now, typically, if you're the attorney for whistleblower B, you'll approach the attorney for whistleblower A and try to reach some sort of negotiation so it's not a fight. Um, but under the law, whistleblower A is the first to file, and whistleblower A receives um, the share of the proceeds. So that's a very, very unique provision of the False Claims Act. This next um, tip is under seal. Uh, we talked a little bit about under seal, but I want to emphasize the importance of filing a case under seal and the conduct of the uh, whistleblower vis-a-vis -vis the seal. The whistleblower, um, once the case is filed under seal and served on the government, um, the seal is in place. And again, it's in place to protect the government's investigation. There have been cases, and it depends on which district uh, the, the uh, whistleblower complaint is filed, but there have been cases where the seal has been breached, quote unquote breached. The whistleblower um, will have told other people that they filed a False Claims Act case. Um, the seal has been breached, either advertently or inadvertently. Um, if that occurs in some jurisdictions, the um, whistleblower can be barred from a recovery. So it's always best to play on the safe side. Um, when you are contemplating filing a case, I always advise not to tell anybody because if you tell somebody, uh, it could tip them off and they may race to the courthouse and then courthouse and then you're barred under the first to file bar. Um, if a whistleblower has filed a, a case and then tells somebody, um, they could potentially be accused of breaching the seal, harming the government's investigation, and they could be barred from a recovery. Um, one other sort of bar that is not on this, but I think it's worth a mention, is the public disclosure bar. Um, which is also under the False Claims Act. It means that if the allegations or transactions of fraud that underlie the False Claims Act have been publicly disclosed, uh, either it can be on any sort of website, uh, in a news report, in a congressional hearing, in a previously a case that is un out from under seal, um, and the whistleblower uh, files a case, the defendants and maybe the courts will, might say, hey, your complaint is based on publicly disclosed materials, um, and unless that whistleblower or the person that brings the case is an original source, means they have direct or independent knowledge of the fraud, then um, they might be barred from a recovery. We are dealing with some nasty law that has been um, um, developed by judges in some of the districts um, inappropriately applying uh, a public disclosure bar and um, so this is something to be very very uh, wary about and uh, it's important to have a, a, a lawyer that is experienced in false claims act or whistleblower lawsuits to be able to navigate these very very tough issues. The next um, practical tip here on the side is to legally obtain evidence. A lot of times whistleblowers will come to the office and they'll say, I have this knowledge, and we'll ask, do you have any documents? And they'll say, um, yes, I do, or, um, you know, we, I, I can obtain them. And I always tell the whistleblower, um, you know, be very careful about the documents. There's, um, you know, they're very concerned about HIPAA laws, and it's a right concern, but if it's in order to disclose fraud, then it's okay to share with your attorneys only. Um, we usually redact that information. but. You know, you don't want, if you're a whistleblower and trying to obtain evidence, you don't want to be breaking into someone else's office, accessing a server or database that you don't normally have access to. Uh, the, the guidance I usually give is if you have access to the information in the ordinary course of business, then that's okay. Um, but I would not, I never advise my whistleblower to illegally obtain evidence because that can always come back. Um, Sometimes whistleblowers will attempt to record, make audio recordings of conversations. Um, that can be uh, wiretappy in some states. Um, you do need con both parties to consent to the recording. So I always advise whistleblowers, uh, if they're going to or they're insistent on voice recordings, to make sure that they're, uh, what state they're in, what state the, the person um, they're recording is in um, before you record. 
um, this next point, um, criminal liability, um, if the whistleblower is the mastermind or the architect of the fraud, we talked about this, um, they could be barred from a recovery of the uh, a share of the recovery. Um, and this last point is also very important. Um, it's uh, about severance agreements and release of claims. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of times, unfortunately, in my line of business, I receive phone calls from whistleblowers who have uncovered some sort of fraudulent conduct and they have first gone to the government and, or, sorry, excuse me, the company and reported the fraud. Um, sometimes the company will fix the fraud, um, but other times, unfortunately, the company will retaliate against the whistleblower by minimizing them, by harassing them, or by terminating them. Um, the whistleblower will then um, seek an employment lawyer, and the employment lawyer usually reaches out to someone like myself. Um, but it's always very important, um, because at these times, the company is pressuring um, the whistleblower to, to have a severance agreement. They'll say, hey, we'll give you this money, but you need to sign the severance agreement. And within the severance agreement is a broad release of claims saying, we'll give you this money if you leave quietly and you agree um, that this money resolves any sort of employment claim and any other claim that you have potentially right now or in the future against the company. Um, unfortunately, some courts have held that this broad release of claims releases a whistleblower's right to file and receive a recovery under the False Claims Act. So um, if this happens, and I always work very closely with the employment lawyer and the whistleblower to either not sign the severance agreement or to um, carefully construct the release of claims so as not to release a claim against False Claims Act liability, this can pose a series of problems because it can just tip the company off that you might be following a False Claims Act case, and it will probably cause the company not to give you a severance agreement. And so that's a very, very fact-specific um, scenario that I usually go very, very carefully over uh, with, with the whistleblower and their employment attorney. So those are some tips to, to uh, be aware of. Um, in conclusion, I just want to talk, take a few minutes to talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, other whistleblower statutes. Um, now, under the Federal False Claims Act, and most of the state False Claims Acts uh, that are modeled after the Federal False Claims Act, um, there's an exemption for tax fraud, meaning um, the False Claims Act says whenever the government is, con is defrauded, you can bring a case except um, tax fraud. You can't bring a case um, where the company is uh, committing uh, tax fraud. Um, some states have most for the most part, followed the Federal um, False Claims Act lead, uh, except in New York and Illinois and a couple of other states allow whistleblowers to file for state um, tax fraud un um, under their laws. But um, the Federal False Claims Act exempts um, federal tax um, claims. And so the IRS has an IRS whistleblower office and a specific IRS whistleblower statute that allows uh, whistleblowers to file uh, a tip if there is tax fraud. It's different than the False Claims Act. It's not a case. It's not a case that can be litigated. It's completely discretionary. If the IRS decides that it does not want to investigate, it does not want to bring the case, there's no recourse for the whistleblower. Um, the whistleblower is just out of luck. Um, and, but to, in order to submit information, the whistleblower must fill out a Form 211 um, which is essentially a form that tells you to um, discuss or disclose all evidence and all legal theories about um, the tax fraud. Um, unfortunately, we have not had a great experience with the IRS whistleblower office. It hasn't been bad, but a lot of times my experience and experience of colleagues of mine have been that the um, cases um, that are filed, um, you get literally no response or a response 10 years later um, declining the case or paying a minimal award. The next um, statute is the SEC whistleblower statute. Um, this was enacted more recently under the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act. Um, and 
it incentivizes whistleblowers to disclose fraud in connection with financial securities. To the SEC, similar to the IRS program, it's a tip that is filed on a form TCR. Um, if the SEC decides it's not going to investigate or file a case, then um, the whistleblower has no recourse. They cannot pursue it after that. Um, it's different than the False Claims Act in that it does not involve government fraud. It just involves securities fraud. Um, the whistleblower will receive a reward, um, but that reward, um, the sanctions need to exceed about $1 million in order to receive a reward, and the reward is completely discretionary. Um, and in order to receive an award, um, the whistleblower must voluntarily provide original information to the SEC that leads to a successful enforcement action. So thank you very much. That concludes um, this webinar on the False Claims Act and various whistleblower statutes. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them now. Or if you come up with any questions later, you can always reach out to me, email me, call me, um, link me in so that you have my contact information. Uh, if years down the road you do end up having a, a question, but it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Lashana, well, thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Um, okay. What if someone knows of potential fraud occurring in a competitor business uh, or a business that he or she does not work for? Can that person file a case under the False Claims Act? Yes. Um, that's a very good question. Um, a, typically, cases um, involve someone that is working with the corporation. They typically have uh, a lot of uh, information. However, that's not always the case. Um, we have had cases and successful cases that have been brought by competitors, um, people that have knowledge of some fraud because they're trying to compete against the alleged fraudulent company. Um, so they come and, and, and give us that information. We file it with the government. The government independently investigates and concurs. Um, and there's been a successful recovery. Um, so, and, and that said, it doesn't even have to be a competitor company. It can be any individual that has, or a group of individuals that have some sort of knowledge that um, a company or individual is uh, violating the False Claims Act or acting in a fraudulent way. Okay. If someone is terminated as a result of reporting fraud that is potentially a subject of False Claims Act lawsuit, are there any protections for the whistleblower? Uh, if the employee wants to file a False Claims Act case, can he or she do that anonymously? Um, another good question. It's a multi-part question. So I'm going to start with um, the beginning, and this is something I did not discuss in the in the presentation. Under the False Claims Act. Um, Section H, we call them H claims, there are retaliation provisions. So um, the whistleblower can, in their False Claims Act case, um, file under Section H um, saying that they were retaliated against for reporting fraud. Um, and also, there are some uh, recourse uh, under various administrative statutes and state specific statutes. So oftentimes, I refer whistleblowers that may have a retaliation case. Um, I would work on the H claim, and I'd also refer them to an employment lawyer um, to talk about a potential uh, uh, claim under administrative processes or a um, state um, employment claim. As to the second part of the question, anonymously, um, eventually I always say, um, I always advise my clients that there's a high likelihood that your name will come out after the case is out from under seal. Um, as soon as a case, a whistleblower case is filed, typically the company tries to figure out who the whistleblower is. If the case is litigated or if the case recovers money, the whistleblower's name will definitely come out. There are some things we can try to do to keep uh, the whistleblower anonymous. Um, we can vaguely describe them in the complaint, uh, and if the case is dismissed, then we name it as a John or Jane Doe um, and to provide them some level of protection. Um, but more recently, the DOJ has discouraged the filing of John and Jane Doe's. Um, we might file under the name, we might create a corporation and file under the name of the corporation. But my point is, is that while there are some things that we can do under the False Claims Act, unfortunately, um, there, none of them are foolproof, and there is a chance that the whistleblower's name will come out. 
Okay. Uh, if an employee learns of fraud, are there any documents the employee should take or not take to document the fraud? And what are the risks associated with taking these documents? Sure. And I, I talked briefly about this on um, the takeaway point. Um, when we um, evaluate a case, um, we assess the credibility of the whistleblower or the employee. Um, and and we asked that whistleblower employee if there's any other witnesses that we could talk to, um, of course, without tipping them off so they file a first, so they go and file a complaint before us. But we also asked for any documents um, because documents are very, very important. The government loves to have some sort of documentary proof that the fraud is occurring. Um, if the whistleblower can obtain those documents in the ordinary course of business, that, that those are the types of documents we want. Um, there have been some counterclaims. Uh, the defendants have filed claims saying that the whistleblower has stolen documents or, conf or disclosed confidentiality, uh, and, and, and those cases typically are not successful, but I always try to tell my whistleblower that they can occur. Uh, mostly they're trying to deter whistleblowers from bringing cases and getting documents. Um, there's one case that comes to mind in New Jersey, and this is sort of a case that um, has where the counterclaim was successful, and again, it's very, very rare that they are. Um, in that case, the whistleblower sort of grabbed a file cabinet full of documents, um, and the court found that she did take documents and, and granted defendants counterclaim. Um, if she had taken only documents specific to the fraud that she was alleging, then she would have been okay. But the fact that she took documents that were not specific to the fraud, the judge came down on her and uh, granted the defendant's motion. Um, but typically, uh, we tell our whistleblower that they're safe if they get documents or files in the ordinary course of business. If it comes across your desk in an ordinary day, then take a screenshot of it, take a picture of it, take a copy of it. Sometimes defendant uh, companies um, track uh, what is being printed. We always tell our whistleblowers to be careful. Um, and we always tell them to keep these documents on a personal, take them home. Don't keep them in the office because if the whistleblower gets retaliated against and gets walked out of the office, they might not have a chance to grab their documents. Um, so it's a very, very precarious situation, um, and we always work very closely with the whistleblower at this time. It's very, very fact sensitive, and it's something to be aware of um, uh, and to consult your attorney about. Okay, and what if an employee finds a minor technical violation? Is there any potential False Claims Act liability? Um, if it is a minor technical violation or possibly an act by a rogue employee, that's not really something that would be the subject of a False Claims Act lawsuit um, because, again, these lawsuits are a lot of time and resources. It's not something that I think an attorney would be interested in or the government would be interested in, or for that matter, the court would be interested in. Um, in order to really form the basis of a False Claims Act lawsuit, it needs to be a company or a corporate policy it needs to be done with um, knowledge or reckless disregard. Um, so if you know um, a rogue employee, employee um, doesn't um, go by the exact regulation, um, I don't think that would be the subject of a False Claims Act lawsuit. It might be a slap on the wrist. It might be something the company addresses. But in order to be a False Claims Act lawsuit, it really needs to be a corporate policy that is directed by people high up and occurring uh, amongst the company employees. It could be in several offices, it could be in one office, but it really needs to be rampant within the company and there needs to be some sort of knowledge um, and you know, materiality. The government has to care about it and the government does not really care about a technical violation. Okay. Uh, in lieu of the time, the remaining uh, submitted questions will be addressed via email after the broadcast. Uh, thank you again, Shauna. Uh, please use her contact information on the screen for any further questions, or if you send us questions, we will forward them on to her. 
You can register for future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at 1STHCC.com or call us at 888-543-4778. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.